You're listening to... Offering in-depth analysis on all things Boston Celtics with your hosts, Jim and Mike Quigley. It's a cold morning here in the Northeast, but the Red, the Red Sox, the Celtics are red hot. And um, welcome to another edition of Hard Foul with my brother Michael and myself, Jim Quigley. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, hope you had a great uh, New Year's and, um, you know, enjoyed it as much as the Celtics did down in San Antonio. Mike, I, I I don't know what is really more to be said. The Celtics continue to be red hot. I know they had some close competitive games at home last week against the Pistons and the Raptors, Raptors under kind of different set of circumstances. Um, and then they go down to Texas and they kind of beat the bag out of the Spurs, you know, in a fun game. Don't get me wrong. It was fun to watch. You got some Wemba Nyama kind of love out there. He he was got, got going in that first half, so you got some of that. And then um, you got the Celtics just turned on the Jets in the third quarter and, and, and blowing the doors off off the Spurs with some, you know, fun, exciting plays. I don't, I don't know what your takeaway is from particularly the last two games against the Spurs or the Raptors. If you want to start there, you want to start with Derek White or other Celtics. I'll leave it leave it up to you. But you know, twenty six and six through thirty two games, um, best team in basketball. I, I I don't think there's any question about that. Thanks, Jim. With the Raptors game, that's another example of a game they would have lost last year and the year before where they came out in the fourth quarter, they had a pretty big lead. I want to say double figures, and the Raptors hit a bunch of threes. The Celtics were clearly not playing well to start that quarter, whether they weren't ready or or focused, the lack of focus. It can be concerning to see pop up in Detroit and Toronto, but the Celtics at the end of the game pulled it out uh, in overtime. No, No, wait. That wasn't an overtime, that was, right? Detroit was overtime. It, it was no, Detroit uh, was overtime. Yeah. 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 Um, but both those games, Detroit and Toronto, you could argue were games that were two games last year and the year before that you would probably see the Celtics in some sort of dramatic fashion, either win because the other team screwed up or lost because they just couldn't execute. And this year, it's there's been a lot of examples of this, of games where you know, we, we've been texting and, and, and we were like, yeah, they weren't great tonight. But again, they pulled it out. Um, and Porzingis and White are a big part of that difference. With moving smart, it, it obviously opened the door for Porzingis to join the team. But even more importantly, the role it's given to Derek White. And in the fourth quarters of both those games and, and over time of yeah. uh, the Detroit game, you saw Derek White really step up when he was struggling for parts of those games. but really showed where he could take over. So um, there's not a lot to say about the San Antonio game. San Antonio's really bad. Yeah. I think out of the the three teams that the Celtics played in their last three games, where none of them are really that good. Even with Detroit's losing streak, San Antonio's had one of their own this year of like 18 or 19 games. Um, that's just a really bad team. And it wasn't very competitive. It was fun. Um, you know, KP struggled in that game, shooting a lot of threes. But once again, when he saw KP go inside against San Antonio, the game really shifted. Uh, the Celtics, when they start going to the hoop, I think I've said it on the pod before, everything else opens up when the Celtics are going to the basket. Because they're so hard to beat in the paint with Brown's ability to get in there, whether he's driving a post and up, same with Tatum, same with White, same with Holiday, and then obviously... You know, Porzingis has dominated the post all season from foul line extended down where he's really unique in how he does it. There isn't anybody else that does it in the league. And um, I think it was another example of that against San Antonio when the Celtics went inside, everything just opened up and the Spurs had absolutely no answers. So Celtics are dominating right now. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we were saying that they weren't a good road team. And coming into this morning, they have the second best road record in the NBA to OKC. Uh, and percentage-wise, they're around the same. So they're doing everything. They're winning at home. They're winning against bad teams. They're winning against good teams. They're winning back-to-backs. Their bench is playing well. So 
Well, things are firing in all cylinders right now, and tonight should be a really good test. So I'm looking forward to tonight. Yeah, so I want to hit on a couple things that you mentioned that I think are important. So you, you bring up the different ways they can win this year, and, and you know whether it's shooting the three or going to the basket. What's the remarkable difference is the amount of post-ups they have compared to last year. I think they were the bottom percentile of the league, and now they're the number one in the league in post-up points percentile-wise. Uh-huh. Percentile and, and, you know, a lot of that's Przingis, but a lot of that is also Brown and Tatum. You know, how uh, how often do we see those guys on the block and just kind of going to work with fadeaways or uh, drop steps? you know, or drawing a double and finding the right read and kicking it out. It's It's been, you know, um, much different in that sense than last year, right? You, you really, there were no post-ups. And um, I guess, you know, the Przingis thing is huge, but credit Tatum and Brown for getting into the gym this summer and really adding that element to their game. And I think it's made a big difference um, with how the Celtics can play you know, it really puts different a different type of pressure on the defense. You know, what's interesting to me, and, you know, Scal pointed this out in the last game, it's just the approach to Pazingas with defenses right now. And yeah. it was the approach the Celtics took last year, honestly, where they would put a small on him. And I know that was kind of the read you would make um, early in his career. And, and thinking you could kind of push him out and it would confuse him a bit and throw him off his game. He's now not even trying to muscle you. He just kind of turns around nope. and shoots. It, understanding uh-huh. that it's almost like a tennis ball on a nerf basket for him, you know, whereas those guys can't contest. And when they do try to contest, as you saw with uh, McDermott down in um, San Antonio, it, it, you know, he gets to the line. So the question becomes is, you know, do the teams eventually start to treat him differently? And if they do, what does that mean for Tatum and Brown? It means that the lanes throwing, are going to open up. Yeah, if they start throwing doubles at him, um, or they start bringing their big out more, because I think that's part of the thought process is, you know, if we stick out big on him, then we need to have that big be able to come out and contest him. And if he does, that takes him away from the rim to contest the Celtics' wings. That also, Porzingis is skilled enough to take them off the dribble. So just the pressure that he's able to put on defenses is, is, really, is really important. And, you know, as we look forward to tonight, Mike, you have an OKC team. And I'm looking forward to this game quite a bit. Um, but you have an OKC team that really plays a lot of wings, uh, or guys that are on six seven, six eight. They don't have a lot of size at all, and I, I do think this is going to be another Porzingis game, especially as we get into the later moments of this. I, I, I think the OKC, unless they make an adjustment, they're going to see you know guys like Lou Dort and Giddy and uh, oh. Williams. Matched up for Przingis late in the game, and, and they're going to be in trouble. I, I, I don't understand why you I, – I guess because they're so concerned about Tatum and Brown going to the basket, that's probably why they're doing that. Because if, if you put Holgram or other teams put a big on Porzingis around the foul line, then that, that's going to open up driving lanes and take away one of your strengths at defending the basket. Um, but I, I, I think at this point, especially in the fourth quarter of games. I think maybe you can get away with it early, maybe through the first three quarters, letting Porzingis do his thing and trying to keep it close. But in the fourth quarter of games, I would have, especially if I'm OKC, and I got a guy who's 7'3", who can match his wingspan, I I would have my big on Porzingis. I would not not put a small on him anymore. It it simply doesn't work. He scores. He has to score against that like 90% of the time. The numbers have to be outrageous when he gets the ball, fall line extended against the small. That's why I get crazy. Like, I understand the three-point shot's a good shot, and I want him to shoot it, but it's like the Celtics could go to that every possession. It's unstoppable. Well, I, I feel like they use that, Mike, to soften them up, right? They have him go out there <laughs> earlier in the game, and you have to extend them, right? So it softens them up a little bit, and then they go, you know, if that thing's not flowing, they stop punching you inside. 
or they stop yeah. running the screen and roll. So even if you want to have Chet Holgram, who I just, you know, it's funny to say this with Przingis, who I don't think has the strength of speed to cover him right now. Um, even if you have Chet, Chet Holgram with that wingspan start on him, the Celtics late in the game could just run a screen and roll. And then all of a sudden you're going to have Jalen Williams down there on, on Przingis. So you're going to have Lou Dort, or you're going to have yeah, Holgram no, I on that. an island with Tatum or Brown. And it makes it, it just at least force the, the Celtics to amazing. do that, though. Yeah, yeah, you know, and hope that the Celtics, because you know, you never know a game on the road. The Celtics could get lazy and not run their offense. Like you got to do something. I, I feel like what you're bringing up, what Scals is bringing up, is just poor game planning, poor film. Like, how do you not notice that Porzingis is dominating the league right now? I just, I think they're picking yeah. their poison. Honestly, I think they're still, and probably rightfully so. Mm. They're, they're still more afraid of Tatum and Brown. And, and they're so fearful of what happens when those guys get going um, with this offense that they become un- the offense just becomes unstoppable when they're going good, when they're going good in particular. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, it will be interesting come playoff time what, what adjustments teams make to this, you know, because they're going to have to make some, and some teams are better suited than others. Certainly, Miami with Bam is is much better better suited than other teams. Um, but yeah, no, they. I think they're picking their poison right I now. Mean, oh, I mean, I mean, Minnesota is well suited as well. If they get there, yeah. If but, they get there, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's it's really interesting you know I, I i'm looking forward to tonight's game i i think okc has been one of those teams that right now i think a lot of people you know the consensus on them is that they're not a top three team in the west in terms of that's where they'll end up but they've certainly played that way that's right and, and, and they, they are and they've beaten you know denver twice um you know they got some really oh, good man. skilled players and this is a big game for them. Uh, this is, you know, I think it's going to have a playoff fail down there in OKC. You're not going to have as many Celtics fans show up because I, I don't think there's as many transplants in Oklahoma City. And I don't think anyone's planning their vacation, you know, post New Year's for Oklahoma City to go watch the Celtics. So I, you're going to have a good environment down there, um, a big game. And for the Celtics, last time you played them, you got, you got embarrassed. You lost by almost 50 points. So this is, um, I think it's setting up to uh, to be a fun night, fun atmosphere. Uh, what's your expectations for tonight? I, I don't agree with the pundits that OKC is not a top three team in the West or a top three team in the NBA. They are. And they have the talent, too. They're just young. That's why people don't believe in them. They're nine and four on the road. So they're they're winning on the road. They didn't just beat Denver. They dominate Denver when they play them. Nobody else plays like they do offensively with the way they attack the hoop over and over and over again. Their center is a, a 40, 50, 90 guy. Their center at 7'3", and he's one of the best rim defenders in the NBA. He's made all the difference on that team. They've always had the talent. Now they have an all-star center who we're going to be talking about, if we're not, as first-team all-defense one day. I, I think they're an NBA title contender they have that much so. talent yeah i don't think that they, they have they have the scoring with sga they they can compete with all these teams in the west i i mean outside of, i mean who who in the west is the favorite right now it's still denver i, I don't know how i yeah but i mean it's how is denver. okc not yeah. in that conversation though because they're not i mean denver. they dominated denver yeah, they dominate them twice. It's regular season. Denver's been there. They've done that. Um, they're just much more well balanced. If you look at their size and across the board, I don't think they OKC has any answers for Jokic whatsoever when it really comes down to crunch time or that two man game between Jokic and, and Murray. Um, you know, Gordon wasn't available the last time they played because of the dog bite issues, which is you know an interesting story that should be examined a little bit. <laughs> But um, I, I think Denver, I, I think the pecking order out there is probably still Denver. Um, Minnesota, I think, has shown that they're real. And I, I think the Clippers in Phoenix are probably all ahead. Oh, no way. At this point. No way. Not Clippers at this point by, by the time the end of the season. I think I think Phoenix and is going to get red hot soon, and um, their talent's going to take over. We'll see. 
Um, already I don't think Phoenix yeah. Can, yeah, but they can't defend anybody. And the other thing about it, too, with OKC is they have more chips than all those teams have when it comes to an acquisition at the trade deadline. If someone, to if move around. Available. If someone's available, yeah. Yeah. Um, so as far as the test for the yeah, Celtics, they don't, have tonight, a, they don't have a ton of size. OKC, they're 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 a bunch of six six to six eight guys outside of whole room, um, and, and it's not, not always the best thing in the world when you know one guy has a ton of blocks. It, it's kind of sometimes it means that too many guys are getting to the paint um, against you. I think they're really really good. I, I and I think tonight they're gonna they're gonna show out and it's gonna be good. And I think they kind of remind me of the Celtics teams, you know, post uh, and pre kind of the Kyrie, you know, those Isaiah Thomas teams where they, they are they they're really really good. They're really really close. I just don't think they're there yet. Those Celtics teams didn't have two All Star talents and they started five. Um, but that's fine. I'd say for uh, who's tonight. The, who's the other all-star talent right now other than SGA? Chad Holgram's already an all-star, an all-star talent. Right now. He's not close to an all-star right now. He may be someday. What you... He is not an all-star right now. Fine. Well, the Celtics didn't have a player in those Isaiah Thomas teams that were close to being an all-star one day. They had an Isaiah Thomas and a bunch of guys. Al Horford like, was an I, all-star. I... Fine, Jim. Fine. Okay. Um I'm just I, like, I can't uh, believe they, they're not a championship contender right now, Mike. I, I don't know. You're out on an island on that to believe that by yourself, I think. I think they could win the West. I think, that's I think they could. Yeah, I think that's crazy. Whatever. Um, we'll see when the playoffs start because Denver has a lot of holes. They do? The uh, yeah. Last year. They're not the same team as last year. They don't have Bruce Bat Brown was a huge part of that team. Their bench is not that good. I don't think they're the same team as last year. I don't think they they're the as focused team. as they were last year, too. They have the same starting five. Yeah, they, they have the same have the starting best, five. They still have the best player in the world. They they certainly do. Yeah. Um, as far as this being a regular season game tonight on the road, this might be one of the tougher regular season games the Celtics see in a long time. Only because I do okay. think the crowd is going to be really, really focused. This is a young team who's going to take this game more serious than other teams will take, as far as what I this agree. means. Yeah, I, and I don't think this. Nice. I don't yeah. think this game means as much to the Celtics as it will to OKC. Uh, and I also think we've seen some tendencies with the Celtics that you know they played a lot of bad teams recently, three games in a row where they haven't had to be focused the entire game which is typical for an NBA season. Um, Something like that can come up to bite you like a bad habit. Somebody has to show you this bad habit's going to hurt you. Maybe that comes up tonight. Um, And the schedule's kind of grind too. The schedule's kind of grind. It's uh, out West, two games back to back at home right after Christmas and then right back to middle America. Like it's, it's been a grind travel wise. It has. And it should be interesting to see what the matchup is at the guard position tonight, how the Celtics go after SGA. Um, I want to say, I don't know if he's a leading scorer in the NBA, but he's definitely, yeah. Yeah. He's definitely up there. He shoots it maybe too much, but um, MVP candidate for sure. Yeah. I don't know if it's Derek White or Holiday. Um, And also, what the Celtics do on switches tonight will be interesting too, because I don't know if you can switch against OKC because they just go to the basket. That's like their whole philosophy. Like they're, they're off, they must put up shots so early in the, the shot clock because of the way they just attack the paint. And I know that's something the Celtics really struggled against, even when they won at home last year. Uh, defensively was just the way they were going to attack the paint. So uh, KP can obviously make a difference there though. OKC puts a shit ton of pressure on you, and they 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 play with extraordinary pace, and not the type of pace where it's like seven seconds and get a shot off. Just constant pressure, like you said, and and, and going to the basket and ball movement. And I, I would not be shocked to see a final score with both teams high one twenties, low one thirties tonight. Like I, I, I fully expect it to be that type of game, which you know for January 
is fantastic to watch, <laughs> you know? So I, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't, I like if the final score was 133 to 125, that, that would not shock me one bit tonight. If it was around that range. And then what's funny is last year, you'd be like, well, that's not good for the Celtics. That's not the type of game. But this year the Celtics can, are going to win. They can win either. But this year, they can win a game 110, 108, 198, or they can win a game 130 to 126. Yeah. Um, and the Celtics I, I, just built I, different. I think the two guys, and you hit on them, I, I think the two guys that you're going to see have big nights, but I think SGA will for OKC uh, for the reasons you outlined. And I think um, for the reasons we outlined earlier, I think KP – I think Porzingis is going to have a, a a really good night for the Celtics. I, I just think this is, you know, OKC does not match up well against him at all. You know, especially if the Celtics can get him in switches. Um, Mike Derek White, he's been just the, obviously his best season in the NBA. I think a lot has opened up playing time wise for him with Marcus Smart's exit. Um, there's no more question about crunch time minutes for him. Um, I, you know, I sometimes lose sleep thinking what the Celtics might have been if he was getting those crunch time minutes last year. Um, because we're seeing what he does with the ball in his hands um, in, in, in big time spots, especially in these last couple games. I, I, in Toronto, he was the guy um, down the stretch. You know, even though Brown is probably the most skilled player, it was White who was getting the ball, making the plays. Uh, and you saw that a little bit in um, Game 7 against Miami until White got hurt. You know, when Tatum couldn't do what he could do, the Celtics finally figured it out in the third quarter. Let's get the ball to Derek White and get him, you know, going downhill. And it, it was working. I I don't know if he's an all-star. There's a lot of really good guards in the East this year. Um, you, there's an argument to be made for him. Case for him, yeah. But he's a winning, winning player. You know, you the, that used to be the thing with Smart. And I'm a Mike Smart guy. I, I loved him on my team. I, I believe in the intangible stuff that people talk about. But he was he was never this good. And, uh, the, you know, M- Malcolm Brogdon was never this good last year. Uh, and, frankly, Drew Holiday, Drew Holiday is not this good now for the Celtics. This has been the best guy they've had post-Isaiah. and. Um, you know, he does it on both ends. I, you know, the amount of, what is he like looking at seven straight games of at least two blocks? He, 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 he had, yeah. the ball, basketball steals, you know, he moves the ball so quickly and, you know, his scoring ability, um, he can do it a lot of different ways. It's just been awesome. Awesome to watch. Um, you know, that's my, that's, those are my thoughts. I've always, I was a white guy going into the season. There was a lot of people saying, you know, consider him in a trade for Drew Holiday. We had a pot about that uh-huh. and how stupid that yeah, would have yeah. been. Um, uh-huh. And I think that's being proven right right now. Yeah, we saw parts of this last season. It was just he got caught up in the mess of who do I play with Smart and Brogdon. Um, and obviously, they needed to be playing white more minutes last year. Who knows what that would have done for their chances, maybe even the year before. But he's improved even from last year. I yeah. I don't ever remember. I know his ball handling was good last year, but this year, like, you'd be able to slow down White in the past by getting up on him, you know. And there were these like it was it was, the conversation would be, you know, he's not he's not a true point guard. He's not, you know, that's what we would say that Marcus Smart really turned himself into a true point guard. That's who he trusts with the ball. Um, White is like Tatum and Brown, where he doesn't really handle the ball pressure. That's not this season. He, he he might be their best ball handler on the team this year. And then the, how quickly he makes decisions, whether he's going to the basket where when he's going to the hoop, it feels like there aren't many people who can stop him from getting to the paint and getting a good shot up. And he's making the majority of those shots. And then how quickly he gets the three-point shot up now. I didn't realize this until I read the athletic article yesterday that He's over 40% from three. He's at 49% from two. And he's from 88% from the free throw line. Yeah. He's the Celtics' best shooter on the team right now, statistically. Which, um, which is amazing it, where, you, you know, where yeah. he used to be as a three-point shooter. Yeah. Well, especially when they first traded for him. Yeah. Uh, first season here, uh, 
he had some moments, obviously, in the NBA Finals game one where he went off. But And that's the thing, too. We've seen, going prior to this season, we've seen this version of Derek White at the end of games take over. He just hasn't been given the keys to do it on a nightly basis. And, you know, he is playing like an all-star. And you're right, Jim. He's probably not going to be an all-star because of the amount of guards who already have big names nor notoriety in the and NBA. good seasons. And real good seasons. And, 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 yeah, and good, great good seasons, right? What Trey Young's doing, Damian Lillard, what have you, Halliburton. Halliburton had uh, 20 assists and no turnovers He's the other night. Been amazing. It's been amazing. Just, been amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, but when you talk about most improved player in the NBA at the end of the season, now that could be an award Derek White should be certainly looking at. Uh, that's a well-deserved honor, I think. Um, all team first team defense maybe he could be looking at 10 this season as well so he'll have his his notoriety where at the beginning of the season the SPN left him off the top 100 list which you've noted to several times was just crazy um, on the Celtics team I wonder where he is as far as like the best player on the team you know what what number he is after Tatum and Brown because he's right up there with Porzingis so yeah. um yeah, he's been he's been phenomenal. He really every, has. Every minute on the floor that goes by right now, his contract number is going up and up on that extension, and good for him. So, and I think of the players that are coming up. You know, obviously Hauser's a distant third, but him, Drew Holiday, and Hauser. He's he's got to be the guy, the priority right oh, now to, to react. Yeah, I mean, I feel like we don't have to have this conversation yet, but win the championship this year and move Holiday next year, so you can extend White. And, and I, think, I, I, I think that has to be the plan. And I think the other thing with Derek White, um, you know, if you look at, you know, you, you you hear it often, you know, back in San Antonio was getting him to believe he could be this good. Right. You know, yes. it was kind of convincing him that he would get there. So I think that has a lot to do with his consistency and the confidence. And you look at his background, you know, as a guy that, you know, wasn't heavily recruited, junior college, transferred to Colorado, you know, wasn't, you know, a top prospect for the NBA draft. And, you know, has kind of had to create his own persona, you know, at every level he's gotten to, right? And, and had to believe that he could be this guy at every level he's gotten to. I think kind of serves him well as a teammate. It serves him well in this league. He's very grounded, but it probably didn't serve him well in terms of understanding how good he is, you know, even to himself. And you, and I think that realization is coming finally, and you, you're seeing that in his play. So, you know, a guy with a great story um, and, you know, not, you know, a lottery pick and it is, you know, Big, big part of what could be a championship team and a, a guy that will get paid a, a lot of money soon. A lot of money soon. Uh, Mike, I have five questions. Are you ready for them? No, but let's go. On the current Celtics roster, which player would you most want to hang out with? Luke Cornett. <laughs> All right. That's a good answer. How come? Because <laughs> I feel like he's... He's dumb enough to just get shit faced at the bar. Yeah, his his, <laughs> his his celebrations on the bench are unbelievable. You know, when there's, yeah. like a, there's a great dunk and he just jumps off the bench. He he looks like a like a just a running dad joke. You know, and um, I I'm kind of with you. It would, it would be him with Derek White. Um, Derek White's kind of got that reserved good guy attitude, and but then you saw him at the University of Colorado uh, opening day game this year and he was kind of going crazy so he has like that kind of get a few beers in me and yeah. I, I'll, I'll go nuts so it'd be one of those two guys but Quinnette looks like just an an absolute absolute riot um so the Celtics you know we're gonna probably do a trade deadline show or you know a couple trade shows do the Celtics make any trade in your mind that's going to be worth you know spending much time on I guess Yes, they're going to trade for Nick Richards from the Charlotte Hornets. He's under contract for two more years at $5 million a year to be a solid backup center. And he's since he started with Mark Williams going down, he's had a bunch of double-doubles. And where he's 27 years old, I don't think the Hornets as a rebuilding team 
have him in their uh, plans. And he's kind of like the type of move that would make sense for the Celtics, the backup center that you could have for several years to solid. I think that's the guy. That, that uh, That's the type of move to make, right? It's the one that's beyond this year, because I, I think if you're going to convince, if you're going to go further into the tax and use that trade exception, it has to be something beyond that, beyond just kind of roster fodder, which is, you know, yeah. with the way the rotation's set. I'm going to, unless they can pull off a move like that, and I, I don't know what it would take to take get a young center under a good contract. Um, I, I, I don't know how much you have to pay. I'm going to go no. And I think, you know, my prediction is I, I think you're going to see Blake Griffin back on the Celtics um, around mm-hmm. the off-star break. Um, as you know, your extra big body, someone that you can throw out uh, maybe for a couple minutes against Giannis or Embiid to get a couple charges, hit a couple corner threes to draw them out, maybe give Al the night off on back-to-backs. That's that's a guy I think you're going to see come back. Um Biggest weakness with the Celtics, outside of the obvious that, you know, injuries, you know, which you could say about any team. But what is their Achilles heel, so to speak, on the floor? Their their history. Their history of losing focus, losing games at home in the postseason. Uh, being out, you know, mental toughness by Miami or just toughness in general by Miami. They have to cope. They have to overcome. Even even though this regular season they've shown it, they have to overcome that history this postseason. That's going to be the moment that they have a bad game in the postseason where they blow a lead at home. or And it will happen. It happens to all good teams. And everybody will be talking about it. Yeah, And it'll and be how, they, how yeah. are you guys going to respond. Yeah. yeah. So that I think that's their biggest Achilles sale. I, I go back to something you talked about um, in a previous pod, and I've been thinking a lot about it, is, you know, Good guards seem to really get off against them, whether it's, you know, and that's not unique. You know, they do it against a lot of teams, obviously, but Halliburton, uh, Dame, I think you're going to see it tonight with SGA. They kind of do extreme drop coverage with Przingis, which makes a lot of sense. Um, There is a huge focus not to give up the corner three, which makes a lot of sense. But in a seven game series, can teams should be able to scheme up against the Celtics if they have playmakers like this, like a Tyrese Maxey or a Halliburton or Dame Lillard that should get those guys to go off. And, and how the Celtics are going to react to that is going to be pivotal to their success in the postseason. Um, this game is fine for the regular season. Um, interesting to see how it will work come postseason time. Um, and it's something, you know, you brought up, you caught early on this season. And it's something that's, you know, Really going to be a watching, not so much now, but once the games really matter in April and May. Uh, Mike, yeah. team most likely to fade. You know, you have a lot of teams that are kind of um, playing above their head or over expectations, however you want to word it, whether it's, you know, the team we talked about already, OKC, Minnesota. Um, and, you know, in the East, you have Orlando, you have Indiana. Um, I might be forgetting somebody else. You had Houston early on, but they've already begun to fade, and you know they're they're really not that good. Um, Out of those four teams, which team do you think is most likely to kind of revert to the mean and maybe just be like a play-in team or something like that? Oh, unfortunately, I'm going to keep Indiana out of that group because I feel like they're they're just a little bit over 500 team, no matter what. and for me, it's it's Orlando, and it's hard to say that because I really like the way they play and the talent on their team. I think they've got to be missing something. They're already starting to play bad basketball. Uh, and it yeah. just feels like to me that the wheels are coming off a little bit and that they could be a team that falls back to like the six or seven seed in the East. I agree with you. I, I think Indiana has so much shooting that they're going to win 45 to 48 games somewhere around there. And be somewhere in that five, six, seven seed. I, I don't think Orlando really has enough shooting. I don't think they have enough experience. They still have too many guys that are ball dominant. Um, and, and and no rim protection. Guys that are, are trying to make names for themselves down there. And I think as the season goes on, um, that could be problematic when these games get tighter. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, and the teams get more of a book on you. 
I, I tend to think that Orlando is going to end up being like a play-in team. I think they're a good team. I think they're going to be involved in the playoffs somehow. I, I just, they're not what they, you know, they, they're not what they were earlier in the season with record-wise. Final yeah. question, Mike. Teams most likely to show that haven't shown yet. So we're talking about, you know, the Clippers to some extent that really have started to play better. I know the Lakers won yeah, the yeah. in-season tournament, but they've been basically a 500 team. Um, you have the Phoenix Suns with the talent they have that have really struggled. And then out east, you got a Cleveland team that should be better than they are. I, I think they're probably what they are, though. Um, what team in the league right now do you think that isn't as much of a factor is going to be a factor come um, April and May? Well, Phoenix will get hot. They'll win a bunch of regular season games. I don't think that they're built to win in the postseason as far as I don't think those guys will be out there. Um, I don't think Bradley Beals is dependable, but I think they're going to win a bunch of games. You know, they're, I think you're already starting. Maybe they've already won three in a row now. Um, offensively, they're just going to be really hard to to to, to cover and to scheme. Um, but I, I don't believe in them to to you know contend for the NBA Finals. But I certainly think they could be a top three or four seed in the in the West by the end of this. Yeah, I, I think all those teams in the West will be better than what they are now. Um, the Lakers, the Clippers, and the Suns. Uh, I, I think right now I would have the Clippers with the highest ceiling. Um, but, you know, that James Hodden pill is just, it's tough to swallow come playoff time. I don't the see Kawhi the Kawhi Leonard pill, too. Like, is the guy even going to play? Yeah, is he going like, to be healthy? And, and then as far yeah. as the Lakers go, they're a playoff team. I don't see them as currently constituted as being close to a contender. Even if, you yeah. know, Davis is playing at a real high level, I, I just don't think they're in that category. I think they're a move away. And um, it'll be a question of whether they, they can do that. They, because they get a bunch of good role players, but none of them that install fear into anybody. Well, they have the GM, though, that'll do a million moves to try to to try to make him contend is like he did last offseason. So I, I certainly could yeah. see D'Angelo Russell's contract being moved. For whatever it brings in, I don't know. I don't think they have any assets to really trade, but the Lakers will certainly try. Yeah, they'll try. And they got some really good defensive players. They have some wings that would have some value on the market. Um, but I, I just... And I thought that Celtics game was a good indicator. I thought the Lakers played well, and they were nowhere near the class that the Celtics are. And right now, um, yeah, it seems to me they're nowhere near the class that Denver's in right now. When Denver, really where do you think Pascal Denver. Siakam ends up? I don't know. You know that's interesting, but I don't see him going to move at the deadline. And I, I end up, you know, I see you know RJ Barrett and quickly they don't seem to be a team that <laughs> wants to tank. I, I, I'm going to guess that they try that they see a core of. Uh, building around him and um, what's his Barrett. name? The the kid Scotty there. Barnes. Scotty Barnes, yeah. Um, yeah. you know they've had. I think I think there's been better opportunities to move Siakam. I think right now, if you're trading for him, you're taking a risk in case he doesn't want to resign with you. So how much do you really want to mm -hmm. give up? Um, he's going to want to get paid. He sees his best opportunity to get paid is in Toronto. So I don't, I don't really see. I'm going anywhere if I was a betting man now. Yeah, I, I guess the only team I was thinking was maybe Philly with Nick Nurse there. Might make sense where they have those contracts they got from um, the Clippers. I think you'd have but to pay Rose. I don't think Toronto's going to do Nick Nurse in Philadelphia any favors. No, of course not. Yeah, yeah. so I, 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 I'd be surprised if he goes anywhere. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I think he's going to, I think they, Want to build around him and Bonds. I think that's the strategy. I don't think it's a good one, but I think that's what they're thinking. So, yeah, yeah. Um, All Mike, right. hey, good pod. Um, hopefully, we'll talk again this week. Uh, I, we should because I think tonight's going to be, I think there's going to be a lot to talk about after tonight's game. Um, Mike, yeah, after this game, thoughts? what are they? Yeah, their schedule, they uh, was it Thursday, Friday, Sunday after? 
to tonight? Is that what it is? I know they play Indiana uh, a couple times in a row, or two out of three or something like that. But yeah, I, I don't know. I thought Utah was mixed in there too. They might be. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, I do. Th- I think they have a another uh, back-to-back coming up. So, yeah, man, tired legs. Um, Celtics have had a little bit of a rough schedule. So we'll we'll see how they uh what what those legs look like tonight. It, it sounds like everybody on the injury report is 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 not. It sounds like they have an empty injury report, so they should all be out there. So that's good. Yeah, should be. I I think both teams should be full strength. Um, pretty well rested. You know, I, depending on how much drinking both of them did over New Year's Eve. I you know I'm, I'm sure the bars close early in OKC. So or maybe they don't. You know, <laughs> probably not. Yeah. So probably not. Um, All right, everyone, I'll talk to we'll talk to you again, hopefully real soon.